Good morning, good afternoon, and um, good evening to all of you connected all uh, around the globe, um, I hope. Welcome uh, to the 18th Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, the IPPN. My name is Jörg Schimmer. Um, I'm the um, Senior Program Officer with the UN Development Coordination Office uh, looking at interagency program facilitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to have you all connected, and it's a pleasure to be facilitating today's session. The SDG Summit last month, the halfway mark to the 2030 um, deadline, sounded the alarm. The world faces big misses across the SDGs by 2030 in the absence of significant acceleration. In the Development Coordination Office, we're supporting resident coordinators in UN country teams in undertaking the common country analysis and in designing and implementing, together with the national governments and other stakeholders, the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, or short cooperation framework, the instrument that supports countries in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Both our analysis as well as support requests from UN country teams and from governments clearly show that integrated analysis and policy support remain um, some of the key struggles and key challenges for UN country teams. Even where we do see a lot of progress with cooperation frameworks, integration tends to look exclusively or more at synergies and mutual reinforcement across SDGs, not necessarily at the trade-offs uh, amongst them. For example, if SDG 2, Zero Hunger, aims for a 10% uh, increase uh, of you know, calorie, average calorie per person per day in a lower middle income country, or even a 30% increase in lower income countries, this would require a significant increase in global crop yield, in global animal production. So how is that compatible with, say, SDG 13 and targets on emission reduction? What policy decisions need to be made to achieve both goals or all goals and the respective targets to ensure sustainable development? The IPPN is an initiative that tries to tackle exactly that. 10 founding UN entities created a community space where we can share lessons and experiences and strengthen collective capacities to apply integrated policy approaches in concrete and practical ways to support implementation of the 2030 agenda. IPPN is primarily an interagency network, though it is open to colleagues in government and academia and the broader development community. It is jointly managed by UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, ILO, and FAO. The IPPN holds a series of monthly knowledge cafes, and this is number 18, to showcase insightful experiences of policy integration for the SDGs. In today's session, we will hear about UNDP's integrated SDG insights reports, an initiative to help countries identify policy combinations that can potentially accelerate progress on the 2030 gen. The integrated SDG insights reports build on UNDP's SDG push methodology, which aims to support UN country teams identify costed pathways for SDG acceleration through data analytics and modeling of integrated policy scenarios. Our session today is headlined by three experts who had led the design of the integrated SDG insights methodology at global level and its application at country level. Ms. Laurel Patterson is Director for SDG Integration in UNDP. She will give us an overview of the methodology and the main findings from the 95 reports which were released at the SDG Summit last month. We will also hear from colleagues in government who are very much preoccupied with the challenge of accelerating their country's progress on the SDGs through policy integration. We have with us today Mr. Jose Pablo Céspedes, who is advisor in the Ministry of National Planning and Economic Policy of Costa Rica, and Mr. Lamin Bojang, who is advisor in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs of the Gambia. Jose Pablo and Lamin will share their country's experience with the integrated SDG insights methodology. 
A very warm welcome to all three of you and um, thank you for joining this Knowledge Cafe. A quick note on uh, housekeeping, the usual. Please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow all colleagues to hear the presenters really well and clearly. Do use the chat function throughout the session to ask questions or share your experience and insights. And lastly, after the presentation, the panelists will discuss your questions and comments from the chat um, in this forum. So without further ado, um, thank you all for joining and I hand uh, the floor to you, Laurel, uh, to start with your presentation. Thank you so much, Jörg. Uh, thank you, Pablo and Lamin. I look forward uh, to your interventions shortly. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. All right, let's get started uh, with the SDG insights themselves and what, what prompted this work, what we had hoped to achieve. We'll certainly hear more from Costa Rica and the Zambia, and especially how do we take this forward? So out of summits and into solutions would be the other alternative title for this session. So when we created the SDG Insights uh, in the first place, our hope was to support countries come to the SDG Summit as prepared as possible. Uh, this summit had a very high level of ambition and countries were requested to come on, to come to the summit, not only prepared with that high ambition statement for achievement in the second half of the agenda, but in an articulation of the transformative pathways the choices and so on that could get them there. And that's a tall order, uh, particularly for the complexity of the challenges uh, that most countries are facing today. So this was an initiative that sought to, br to bring together the best information, uh, the best tools, the most useful and relevant approaches in a collaboration with government to chart those choices. And just as Jorg had mentioned, not only the choices uh, and crafting an art opportunity space based on the synergies, but also a very clear look at what stands in our way. What are the barriers and what are the trade-offs and how do we navigate them? And I think that's something very interesting that our work certainly connects with the Global Sustainable Development Report 2023, uh, which also talks about how important it is to identify design policies and implement them, not only with the synergies in mind, but with the trade-offs, perhaps the trade-offs even being more important uh, to have at the front of our minds when we are implementing policy choices for the SDGs, not only um, synergies. We're going to look at both. Uh, we certainly found that this approach resonated at the summit. We certainly felt that we heard a lot about the SDGs at the summit, their relevance, how important they are, um, not only in the second half in the run-up to 2030, but moving beyond it as well, too. So we were happy to see that. And our approach, the support from UNDP uh, in very strong collaboration with the UN system is focusing at the national level and at the subnational level. What does this really mean in action? And what really stands in our way that's different in different contexts? And those are the challenges we need to articulate and overcome. We were encouraged at what came through the political declaration as well, too. A very strong signaling on financing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that through the SDG stimulus. A real call for bold choices, transformative action, uh, which we certainly uh, plan to support countries take forward in the second half. And absolutely this need for a strong evidence base. Uh, effective use of data, tackling those gaps, which we know very well. We heard those in the headlines over and over again. But how? And how do we do it in a way that allows us to make better choices today? I think this is really the key. Um, and I'll be really interested to hear from Lamina Pablo in this respect. So I'm going to give you a very quick run through what's in these reports. Uh, many of my colleagues are online. This was a collective effort. And even within UNDP, almost 400 people work together uh, to bring these reports, uh, this collaboration to life. So the first thing is we looked at the STG trends, and this is based on uh, globally reported data as captured uh, through UN statistics. We look at target level SDG progress. The color coding is familiar to many of you, I'm sure. It's on track, what's off track, and what's for review. The gray portion of the rings that you see is where we don't have data. And we know this, colleagues, and we think it's important uh, that we put this up front as well, too. Out of 169 targets, we have data with internationally recognized methods uh, to gauge progress for 140. 
of those 169 targets. So these are real gaps that need to be tackled. We felt that presenting this in the five Ps was also an interesting way for us to look at progress across different aspects of the agenda. And all of this can be found on UNDP's Data Futures platform where you can go through all of the details um, at, the, at the goal, at the target and at the indicator level. So it's good to know where you've been, but it's not good enough for decision-making. So the next part of what we brought together is an analysis of national priorities and their alignment to the SDGs. And we created a machine read capability. Uh, you can go again to the Data Futures platform right now, see what this looks like, see what's behind it. Uh, and the bigger the bubble that you see here reflects the higher resonance of that particular goal based on the reading of national priority documents. And those national priority documents were selected and identified by government. So we start all of this work in conversation. How do we bring the most important documents and the, the, the machine reading capability, which we developed, also allows us to weight documents differently so we can really get a sense of what is resonating, whether or not a national priority, a national development framework mentions the SDGs or not. So this allows us to get a sense of this is where we may be on track. This is where we might be off track. Uh, does that resonate? Is, it, is there a strong alignment with the priorities and investments that's happening at a national level? If not, what might what might that tell us? What could we do differently? Is there an opportunity for different choices that have a better chance of accelerating development impact? And for us, to the point uh, that Jörg had also made in his introduction, where are the multipliers and what are the trade-offs? So one of the things that's most powerful about the 2030 agenda, and I don't think I'm, I'm saying anything new to this audience here, but it, it's it's interactions. This is an integrated agenda. This is a universal agenda. And when you start looking at this at the target level, uh, we brought the best science-based framework of interlinkages, both synergies and trade-offs into this work to say, how can the way that we invest in jobs, um, decent work for all, equal pay for work of equal value, that's 8.5. How do we invest in that in such a way that we are empowering young people, target 4.4, that we are building economic opportunities for women, that we are building inclusion, 10.2. What would it look like? That's an SDG opportunity space. And those are choices that can have these multiplier effects. We can measure them. We can see this across different areas. And so across 95 countries, that we collaborated with, there's a lot of variation and that's good and what we would expect. But what I'm showing you here is a couple of things that came up for us right away. And the first is a lot of countries put the emphasis on growth and particularly on jobs. And that's extremely important. Many countries around the world, growth is, is slow uh, and many are still recovering from COVID. So this really matters in terms of an ability to drive towards other aims that they might have, including poverty reduction, poverty eradication. So here you see the cluster at the target level, extremely specific, how we can advance jobs in a way that is a true SDG proposition and what those other areas are, those positive multipliers that we can start to see gains from these investments. The second is effective institutions at all levels. That's 16.6. .6. And what was interesting to us in the poorest countries that were part of our, our 95 in our collaboration, we saw a very strong connection between effective, solution, effective institutions to be able to deliver on fair economic foundations and effective institutions to be able to deliver public services better in health and education. So one of the things that's interesting for us, we'll get into some of the conversation today, what would it look like if our indicators for effective institutions, we could see them in the way that health outcomes were improving. We could see them in the way that education outcomes were improving. It tells us that these are institutions that are delivering for people, for the people that they serve. I'll go a little faster through the other two. We found resilient infrastructure was extremely important in many contexts, and you see the combinations that makes that most powerful here. Mm -hmm. And last, in sustainable cities, where we're able to not only advance a, a, a green transition in many ways, protect people from the worst impacts of, of climate, but also build more inclusion and build innovation uh, into the way that cities develop and grow.
So that's a lot of information. Uh, and there's more when you get into the details. And we have tried very much to build our approach to this work with digital in mind. And we've built an AI chat assist at UNDP to allow you to ask different questions into this work. This for us is uh, what we've called playbooks. It, it reflects some strategies, it reflects some tactics. It's a way for us to build effective conversation spaces and take this into action and implementation. You've gotta be able to find the information to do that well. And that's the effort and intent behind our chat assist. What's holding us back? And Jorg again also started with this and I'm sure Pablo and Lamine will speak to it as well too. It's not good enough to carve an opportunity space. It's not good enough to say, this is what we could do on a sunny day. There's not so many of those at the moment for many countries and we're aware of that. So how do we look clearly uh, at the challenges that we're facing and how do we identify ways that we could overcome some of those obstacles? So the first thing that we look at in our reports is GDP. Uh, we look at growth trajectories based on IMF, uh, global economic outlook. And then we look at both the inclusiveness of those growth pathways and the sustainability of those growth pathways. And that we measure in terms of carbon intensity and short run poverty gains or losses. And what we found just looking across this top bar is that in 72 out of the 95 countries that we worked with, they have overshot emissions. And many of them are either stagnant in terms of poverty eradication or we've witnessed reversals. Okay, so that's the reality. And that's the place that countries are starting from right now. And unless we are clear about that, it's very difficult to chart a pathway that can be meaningfully implemented. We plan to take this work further. It certainly resonates with the work that many are doing beyond GDP towards the summit of the future, but we wanted to get going here and start to look at what this could tell us about SDG implementation in the second half. And the bottom row that you see here is looking at different finance indicators and considerations of fiscal and financial health. We know from other work that UNDP has led the countries spend much more servicing debt than they do on education, than they do on health, than they can on social services. And this prevents them from making exactly the investments that we chart, started to chart in the other sections of this report. So it's very important to us, together with these 95 countries, we called and emphasized for an SDG stimulus around specific areas that matter for them. And again, together with the UN system, we brought in any data that we have available through INFFs to really be precise as possible in the opportunity spaces that can unlock financing uh, to make the investments that are needed uh, in second half of the agenda. So for us going forward, we really want to ensure that we've got our strong foundations together. We understand where we are, we're tackling gaps, and we're using AI and other digital tools to synthesize and understand policy priorities quickly. We want to continue to focus on the interlinkages uh, both the synergies and the trade-offs, what does this tell us about making better choices that have multiplier effects? And how do we do that with a science-based foundation? Uh, this cannot be hopeful. This has to be data-led. And finally, there's, there's a lot of work and opportunity space for us moving into next year towards the summit of the future to build the political will, to build the financial foundations, and to really work genuinely as a collective in solidarity towards achieving the SDGs. And you can find a little bit more about the countries that we worked with so far. You can find the data foundations, a little bit more of the story of our findings, but especially the methodologies and approaches in the two links that I'm sharing here. York, back over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, an excellent overview. Uh, and I love how you reframed the, uh, the, the, the title of the cafe when you said, you know, out of the summits into solutions. Um, and I think this is um, exactly where we're also going uh, Going now. We're going to Costa Rica and we'll hear from Jose Pablo about the experience of um, Costa Rica to date and maybe also uh, looking ahead um, uh, into, into the next few months and next few years. Jose Pablo, uh, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank, thank you, yours. Uh, thank you, Laurel. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, esteemed representatives and fellow panel members. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, express my gratitude for the invitation from the technical secretary of the SDGs, 
really important this kind of opportunities to promote Costa Rica's SDG work. In this case, the experience of a in and the utility of Costa Rica's SDG integrated report. Uh, next, please. So uh, has Laura tell us the SDG integrated report uh, is built from the selection of different policy documentations made available for machine learning to identify the different top priorities of public and social policies. In this regard, uh, the technical secretary of the SDGs has identified a set of public policy documents of vital importance for sustainable development in the country, where we can mention some like the uh, National Strategic Plan, which is the long-term planning instrument already linked with the SDGs, also the National Development and Public Investment Plan, which is the short-term uh, national planning instrument also linked with the SDGs, and other likes the territorial economic strategy, the national policy for poverty reduction and social inclusion, and other documents uh, has species and other policy uh, policy products from uh, different stages on different levels of government. Uh, next, please. Uh, in this case, this analysis resulted in the identification of the SDGs with some potential to accelerate in Costa Rica, as um, Laura tells us. In this case, uh, the, the report identified uh, five uh, SDGs, as we can uh, see in the, in the screen. In this case, the uh, SDG 5 with the it has DG5, 8 and 9 with the target uh, 0.5, the SDG10 with the target 0.2, and the SDG16 uh, with the target 0.6. This is very important because it's functional for the evidence-based decision maker that accelerate the SDGs in the country through policies, plans, and other projects. Uh, next, please. Uh, one of the main results mentioned in the SDG push uh, can have a significant impact in the sustainable development by reducing poverty. Based in the last five SDG mentioned and the respective targets, and well, uh, this is really important in the case of Costa Rica because if we apply the SDG push, we uh, can attack one of the real problems of the society because uh, considering uh, takes the high and sustained levels of poverty in Costa Rica is very important to apply the SDG push and, uh, up and use this kind of results uh, and entry points to uh, make a better life and, well, uh, in reduce the poverty levels in Costa Rica, which is a really uh, uh, a real problem here in Costa Rica. Uh, next, please. <laughs> Regarding the utility of the SDG report, it was a great importance building the acceleration plan for 2030 agenda presented last September in the United uh, Nations SDG Summit. This acceleration plan includes 17 country commitments with uh, 14 of them uh, aligned with the SDG acceleration actions uh, defined by United Nations. So uh, the result of the report is used by this important state for sustainable development and to communicate the different commitments in uh, the, the summit 2023. Uh, next, please. Other areas uh, where this report is used is the national SDG target strategy. This is a this represents a forward-looking planning instrument for the 2030 agenda, integrating the three dimensions of sustainable, the social, the economic, and the environment perspective for sustainable development in Costa Rica by 2030. This is vital uh, effort as it makes the country one of the few that address paragraph. 55 of the 2030 Agenda Resolution, with, uh, which calls for the definitions of the national SDG target. In connection with the report, Costa Rica 
has defined a total of five national targets by 2030 agenda related with the other uh, SDGs identified in the report for in four of the <laughs> we defined national target related with four of the SDG uh, identified in the report. So we can identify uh, these uh, these elements has uh, entry points of the SDG and the SDG push in, in some instrument important has the national targets of the SDG. Uh, next, please. Uh, also, well, in summary, we defined 55 national targets with uh, 170 actions in this instrument, which represent 4.4% uh, of the GDP in investment. Uh, so in terms of this instrument, it represents a serious roadmap considering not only the best practice in, in terms of planning, uh, most importantly, the nature of the 2030 agenda. So this is a really important instrument for Costa Rica, where uh, we use the results of the report to improve and innovate the, the methodology and the, uh, the different elements of the, of the instrument. Uh, next, please. Another functional approach of the report is the SDG localization strategy here in Costa Rica, integrated by uh, the National uh, Planning Ministry, the UN National Office, and the Local Government Institute. And it represents uh, the local approach to the 2030 agenda. This strategy is built upon the network of the SDG promoting local government which already includes a total of 48 local governments covering over the middle of the country municipality. So it's a really strong strategy for localizing the, the SDG in Costa Rica, where we can use this kind of report, this kind of outcomes to improve the, the, the elements of localization, the, the SDG and the 2030 agenda. Uh, next, please. Uh, in addition to the extensive coverage of the network, as I mentioned, the result has been reflected in the presentation of six voluntary local reports last year, uh, underscoring the efforts in localization the LDGs in Costa Rica. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is this could be a, a potential uh, instrument to uh, to use the outcomes of the report to improve the localization. Uh, the SDGs in Costa Rica. Uh, next, please. Likewise, uh, all previous is complemented by the multi-sectorial commitment to advancing uh, to the SDGs. Remember that Costa Rica was the first country in the world to establish a national pact for the uh, SDGs. And this pact has, uh, has recently been relaunched in, and it involves uh, 24 represent sectors and find new additions. So uh, we can find not only uh, some instrumentally, uh, some instrumentally uh, use of the results, but all, also the, the, other, the other approach has political approach like this. Uh, next, please. And uh, in conclusion, well, uh, we can mention uh, modern approaches like this report serve Serve has tools for planning and implementing the SDGs in, uh, in this case in Costa Rica. So this report is important for evidence-based decision making for sustainable development in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica has successfully integrated the results of the report into the acceleration plan uh, presented last September in the United Nations uh, Summit, the SDG Summit. And well, uh, the integration has been functional uh, with international SDG target strategy and other strategy like, like localization strategy, as I mentioned. And additionally, we have a political and social commitment for advancing for the SDG. So uh, this is really important. We really appreciate this kind of exercise, this kind of report to improve and innovate the decision making to uh, have better life and well, uh, 
achieve the 2030 agenda. Uh, this, is, this concludes my presentation. We would like to reiterate the Costa Rica's gratitude for the opportunity to show the country significant progress implementing the 2030 agenda to the international community. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jose Pablo. Um, very, very interesting. And I think um, speaking to what Laurel initially also um, talked about, sort of the, the analysis, the planning, the evidence base, but really informing, as you say, decision making, informing investments. Um, I took uh, note of the, you know, the 4.4% of GDP um, uh, investment kind of re, I guess, re repurposed, refocused based on that analysis. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. Um, and with that, we now um, shift to the Gambia to hear about another uh, experience um, from the country level. And um, I hand the floor over to Lamin. Uh, over to you. Lamin, I think you're muted. We cannot hear you yet. Okay, thank you very much. I... Okay, yeah, I just want to say thank you to Laura, Jose, and the moderators for this uh, important discussion. Uh, we all know, as alluded by other speakers, uh, SDG is about human development, but this human development has been challenged. We are at a crossroad and definitely as governments, uh, international partners at civil society, we must do something in order to avert the possible danger that is about to come. We should not sacrifice the lives of the current generation as well as the future generation to come. That's why as governments and development partners, we must take some push actions in order to accelerate growth and development. Basically, I will just uh, look at some basic data, which I won't take much. Yes, economic growth force, if you look at it, is very important for development, but we need growth that is broad-based so that everybody is lifted. So SG, SDG, uh, GDP growth alone is not important, but it has to be broad-based. Uh, if you look at the trajectory in the Gambia, basically, uh, we see to it that uh, the growth is basically twice that of the glo global average. Uh, this year, by end of this year, we are projecting about 6% growth. Uh, also, the growth trajectory uh, currently we are experiencing is a bit better than the uh, before the pandemic level. So the implication is this, is that we expecting the incidence of poverty to go down. So the on the positive front, we expecting that uh, we are not expecting to see high carbon emission. So which means that the growth basically should not compromise the environment. So carbon intensity or fossil fuel usage, we expecting these things to go down. Uh, evidently, uh, if you look at some national projects that we have currently we have solar, some solar parks that have been developed to generate electricity this is something which is very important next slide please okay on the sdg trends as other other presenters have highlighted on here uh, looking at uh, the various trajectories of the SDGs using uh, UN statistics standards and methodology. But here, what is very important, we will be looking at uh, the five P's of sustainable development and also the various color coding in trying to explain the level of progress towards the various targets and indicators. So under the five P's, we have the people, the planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. These are core because these are the upliftments we want to make. So in order for the 
uh, SDG is to be realized, these are, should be the areas of focus that should be enhanced. But the various color codings, as highlighted earlier on, if you just lose the, the traffic lights, you know, to see whether we are off track and off on track. So various priorities, uh, as far as the Gambia is concerned, uh, we had six major priorities that were identified, but they were trimmed down to three key priorities. But here, uh, national priorities are generated using machine learning, but by taking reference of the various national documents. So it was not done in isolation. We have the National Development Plan, which is called the Recovery Focused National Development Plan for the Gambia. This is a document that mainstream the attainment of SDG. So we have the voluntary report, the CCA report, the UNDAF, uh, the voluntary report, and the poverty assessment and gender report. So all these documents were consulted in coming up with these uh, national priorities. Next slide, please. So the interlinkages, the interlinkages are important in the sense that here you see how action in one SDG basically creates impact on another SDG. In other words, it's like you are looking at the multiplier aspects of the SDGs. Based on the uh, key national priorities that were identified after consultation with the various national documents and systems, uh, we have uh, building resilience for environmental, economic, and social disaster, which is 1.5. Then you have SDG 8.5, which is talking about full employment and decent work with equal pay. Another one is the SDG 16.6, development of effective, accountable, and transparent institutions. These are things that are very much important and areas of focus, which we believe that they can impact they can serve as multipliers to the various aspects of development. So there are some uh, critical aspects for SDG acceleration, which we have to take into consideration. For every economy to grow, there are certain conditions that are important. One is innovation. Innovation is important in terms of uh, creating low carbon technologies that can outperform the high carbon businesses. If you want to grow, you have to innovate. And the cost of innovation should be comparative or should be lesser than the existing technologies right now. Take for, take for example, when it comes to, let's say solar. If you want to solarize and you want it to be generally acceptable, the cost of producing and generating that solar energy should be cheaper. The other one uh, is uh, the deployment of artificial intelligence, which is also very important. Another aspect which is necessary for growth is policy. Policy is very important in terms of shifting production and consumption towards low carbon sources. This is very important for growth since we are talking about sustainable development. So which means that we should grow but not abuse the environment or let's not abuse the ecosystems that we have. And then finance. Without finance, there will be no sustainable development. This is something that we have to understand as, as governments, uh, it is important to, end, to uh, augment or to promote domestic resource mobilization. Countries should be in a position whereby they, they are able to generate enough revenue. I'll just give you an example. If you look at uh, the Gambia, basically, if you look at tax to GDP, Basically, you're talking about 11%. 
this is less far less than the ECOWAS average, which is about 16%. When the OECD, they are talking about 35%, something like that. So this is a challenge. Partnerships are very important. So the goodwill and working with the international committee, community is important towards a win-win solution. Next slide, please. So if we are to uh, look at the various priorities that are identified here, we talk about 1.5, which is building resilience of the poor to reduce exposure to environmental, economic, and social disasters. This is definitely in line with our national development plan. As, for, as I said earlier on, the national de development plan basically is SDG based. SDG is mainstream. Okay. But uh, looking at the challenges that we have over the years, uh, if you look at uh, the incidence of disaster, uh, you had uh, in 2016 to 2019, about 1,569 people to 4,000 to 4,000 people who are seriously impacted by disasters, natural disasters. And most of these incidents are as a result of flood. You know, during the uh, past two years, we had a uh, serious downpours that affected significant part of the country. And if you look at the uh, country, you will find today that most of those people are staying in areas that are prone, prone to disasters. These are either wetlands or areas where you have, uh, that are waterlogged or areas that are not very condu conducive for human habitation. So what do we need to do as a government? Or what are the possible areas of intervention that we need to do in collaboration with partners? One of the potential areas is that there should be national zoning. Gambia is one of the few countries you go where you don't have proper zoning. People can settle anywhere. But in other countries, you, the countries are zoned. You have areas for habitation, or areas for agriculture, areas for industries. But this thing is basically lacking in the Gambia. If, even though it exists in some areas, but to enforce these regulations are sometimes very, very difficult. Lamin, so, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in. I'm just very mindful of time and we want to give uh, participants the opportunity to also ask you a few follow-up questions. So if you um, wouldn't mind maybe wrapping it up in, in one or two minutes, that would be great. Okay. Sorry. To that, that, that's great. So the all, other one is building urban drainage system, uh, urban uh, protected areas and restoration of degraded lands. These are things that are important. Also economic generating activity, uh, such as tourism, recreational facilities within the uh, degraded areas. Land restoration is something very important. Next slide, please. Yeah, under full employment, full employment, uh, this is also very important. Uh, the National Development Plan take cognition of this. Uh, one of the challenge that we have is high urban, uh, we have a high youth unemployment. Basically, youth un unemployment starts about, stands about 38% of the population, 38%. This is something which is very significant. Uh, if you look at it, uh, you basically uh, form about 70% of the population are under the age of 30, and 44% of the population are under the age of 15. So this is a ticking time bomb if you don't manage them well. This is something that we definitely want to highlight. So there should be possible synergies directed towards this in order to overcome the issue of uh, uh, employment. Next slide, please. The other area is 16.6, which is looking about develop effective 
accountable and transparent institutions. These are very important. The government institutions or public institutions should be fit for purpose and should be able to serve the need of the population. We just give an example, like if you want to apply for a driver's license, sometimes it takes time. It can go for more than two weeks or so. Passports, ID card, land leasing can go for about two years in some instances. Procurements in government should, most of the procurement basically is not digitalized. These are challenges that uh, we feel should be overcome in order to accelerate uh, SDGs. Uh, next slide, please. So on the plus, by looking at all the three major priority areas as far as the SDG is concerned and the expected interlinkages, we expected that uh, investment policy and efforts towards these three areas will definitely help to dent the trend of poverty. If you look at the graph, basically, it's saying if you operate as business, if you operate business as usual, you can see the trend of the red line. But the red line. But if we do something, we will realize that the incidence of poverty will expect it to go down as we progress towards the ages. Next slide, please. Yeah, on the constraints, uh, financial and other fiscal constraints, I think I spoke about it when I was talking about the issue of taxes. So next slide, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So basically, as far as uh, we are concerned, these are the areas uh, where we feel that uh, Gambia and in collaboration with our development partners, we will be able to do more in order to improve the lives of the people as far as SDG implementation is concerned. So for the purpose of time, I think the core of the issues have been talked about. So maybe the rest of the issues can be in the slides, maybe for further reference, especially to those who might be interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lamine. Very um, insightful. Uh, and yeah, so much in there around the possible investments in the Gambia, also the highlights you made around innovation, AI, the need for policy adjustments, the need for financing. And I've seen the chat um, already. Um, some uh, conversations going on, also highlighting uh, the importance of, of, of partnerships in, in, in that regard. So with that, colleagues, um, we open the floor. We open the floor for um, a discussion, uh, the chat for comments, sharing your experiences. You can uh, raise your hand uh, and we'll unmute you should you want to come in uh, with your voice um, and share reflections. So uh, please um this is your space now so uh, use the opportunity to engage with our panelists and as we uh, monitor the chat and the hands uh, maybe i can just ask a couple of sort of icebreaker questions if you will um one to uh laurel um i'd be interested also from of course a, a dco perspective um how do you think um you know, the work um, can or maybe already has been, um, you know, supporting, feeding into the work of UN country teams into maybe an analysis, a country, common country analysis, um, uh, maybe, you know, the design or implementation of or the review, sort of a re rethink or an adjustment of, of cooperation framework. So really that work in support of, you know, the country team as a whole. And to um, Jose Pablo, um, a question linked to the partnerships element that came up in the Gambia. I'd be interested to, to hear a little bit more about who was involved. You mentioned the different action plan strategies, et cetera. Can you speak a little bit about the, the sort of multi-stakeholder um, element of, of developing those? And as you answer, Laura, I'll pass you the floor first, and Jose Pablo will keep monitoring the chat. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, York. Thank you, everyone. Maybe two ideas there. One, I think uh, <clears throat> there's a big opportunity for us to utilize this kind of analysis 
both in the CCA and the Common Country Assessment, but also in the prioritization uh, of a cooperation framework, knowing also that there's a, a, a refresh uh, of the cooperation framework happening right now. And I think that's important uh, because this provides a different evidence foundation uh, to maybe challenge some of our, our ideas around what works, what can really drive progress, what really uh, has the most multipliers, how do we make the progress most meaningful across a number of different areas, what would that look like? So again, those are all processes that require close collaboration, they require very strong partnerships, and of course there's a lot of methods to do that, but I think this can be a useful part of maybe challenging some of our assumptions, checking back in, what do we know, what could we know, what what might we want to get, investigate further as part of the strategy process. The other thing that I think this can be useful both for country teams and our partnerships with government and others nationally is where are there are points for acceleration. Uh, and again, that has as much to do with the, with, the, with the political direction as it does what the data is telling us. And that's important. So where is the opportunity space in a country today? It might have been different a few years ago. It might be different four years from now. What does it look like today? Where is there energy? Where is momentum? Where is there an opportunity with private sector? How do we bring that together now that would be different otherwise? And these are these are political uh, choices and I think um, they need to be made politically. This can inform and support those processes to be as effective as possible. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, very interesting. Jose Pablo, over to you. Thank you, uh, George. Well, this is a good question. The identification of the different policy documents was carried uh, out in the light of the internal analysis within the national planning system, uh, in which uh, we, we were uh, able to identify those serious planning instruments adjusted to good practice and link it with the, with the SDGs. Uh, in terms of the participation uh, along the uh, uh, along the lines, well, we have participation of the different powers of the Republic. Uh, the three powers of the Republic was participating in this kind of defining the, the different policy documents and also all the academia, the business sectors, onions, uh, civil organizations and a multi multilateral uh, organization. So we try to 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 uh, improve and use the instrument in planning all, all, almost linked with the SDGs. I mean, we have the preference uh, to these instruments uh, adjust to best practice in terms of planning, which have indicators, have, a, a, have a budgeting and are also linked with the SDGs and 2030 agenda. So we have to try not only a mega exercise of the SDGs, uh, also uh, uh, use the instrument of planning uh, with uh, SDG perspective, with the SDG uh, linkables and this kind of thing. So uh, we have to, uh, we use the national planning system to to select and to make uh, or, or, or take uh, more participation of the different actors in the society. Thank you so much, uh, Jose Pablo. That's um, again, very interesting um, insights. Uh, we keep monitoring the chat and um, the microphones, the hands, please. Uh, this might be your last uh, um, opportunity because we will have to wrap it up soon. I do see a hand from um, Suhuma Mokos, Mokosisi. Uh, I might have that name completely wrong. Um, we'll open the mic and um, can we open the mic from here? Ask to unmute. There we go. And the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks uh, for the for, for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to to check. Uh, with the various speakers, uh, but what, what are the implementation uh, challenges that, that, that have been encountered by the various countries? Um, looking at the, the various plans uh, that, that, that they've been developed, it could be their national plans, 
vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the how are they aligned to 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 the SDGs, and also what tools or mechanisms that have been put into practice. Uh, to enable prioritizations and, and trade-offs, because in a number of countries, you will find their competing interests. There's the issue of maybe skills development. You you, you would want to promote uh, economic growth, deal with issues of um, transitioning to a low carbon, uh, carbon economy. How do you achieve um, uh, issues of trade-offs and, and prioritization? So those are the issues. I think I picked up something from uh, the speaker from Gambia around uh, the the issues of solar manufacturing. Uh, what, what what are the uh, capabilities in terms of uh, skills, um, investments that they've managed to attract, you know, towards that and, and, and what, what how competitive is that sector manufacturing in Gambia compared with um, countries like your China? So these are the things that I felt maybe it would be ideal to be unpicked, as well as for them to perhaps look uh, uh, at identifying some of the different uh, <clears throat> different value chains that could exist within the agriculture sector. You know. Because a number of countries in in, in, in within 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 sub-Saharan Africa, they seem to be, uh, uh, their economic growth seem to be uh, hinged or around around the issues of um, agricultural value chains. I know, and and what 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 are, what are the strategies that they have in place as well to promote issues of industrialization, because this is what. What, 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 what is seen to be driving economic growth in, in, in a number of those countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, some very um, valuable reflections, but also the question to, uh, in the interest of time, I would uh, pass this on to Lamin and then Jose Pablo, because I think the focus was um, sort of on the on the country space. Um, given the time, I would have to ask you, I'm afraid, uh, to maybe keep it to one one minute each. I know it's a big question, but if you could uh, could be uh, rather rather short. And of course, you know, this is uh, a, a stepping stone, a discussion space here. And it doesn't mean, you know, once the webinar ends, this this concludes. And we'd be happy to reach out to colleagues and, and further, of course, continue the conversation. Uh, Lamin, I'll, I'll pass the floor first to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, yes. Basically, I think the major challenge as far as SDG uh, implementation for the Gambia is concerned is financing. As I uh, spoke about earlier on, uh, revenue to GDP definitely is very low, which is almost about 11%, which is definitely on the downside. Uh, on aspect of financing also, sometimes you realize that the commitment from our partners, some of them are either based on conditionalities and some of them hardly come by as projected. So these are some of the challenges. Uh, the other gentleman who asked about solar, basically there is a solar park being developed through the funding of the UND, uh, sorry, World Bank, the World Bank Group. Uh, the solar basically are not manufactured in the Gambia. I think when it comes to solar manufacturing, if you do your research, you realize that China has the scale. They have the you know the scale in terms of uh, cost, so they have that comparative advantage. However, it doesn't mean that our countries cannot do it. I I have been following uh, solar for a very long time. There is a young man with less than 30 years who is doing the same thing in Nigeria. So these are these are low technologies. Solar technology is not that complex. So people can be trained and they'll be able to do it. Maybe he can go to YouTube and Google or type solar manufacturing in Nigeria. People are doing it. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Lamin. Jose Pablo. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. Well, uh, for uh, developing countries, we can mention many challenges, uh, but uh, one of them, of course, is the budgeting. So it's a, the fiscal restriction is a really, really uh, problem and issue to, 
to achieve the, the, the SDGs and 2030 agenda. So we depend on the cooperation. And we have to remember, we have uh, geopolitical conflicts in, in Europe and now in, in, in Israel. So the cooperation is uh, through uh, this country. So the fiscal and the budgeting is a uh, really challenge to attend and for looking other options, other opportunities. So we have to innovate in the different terms. In this case, Costa Rica innovate with the SDG national strategic uh, targets. So we have to uh, improve and uh, promote and have a, a, ser a serious roadmap to achieve and, and make the SDG push a reality and will have the results uh, which I mentioned uh, earlier in the in terms of poverty, for example, where Costa Rica have a serious problem. So uh, if I have to mention one of the problems, of course, budgeting is one of them. Uh, considering the geopolitical situation uh, in the last days in the uh, and also in the last two or three years, and uh, in, in response of this kind of, of situation or problems or challenges, we have to innovate and 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 uh, use this kind of reports to define a serious roadmap with budgeting, with actions, with responsibilities to uh, achieve the twenty thirty agenda by uh, twenty thirty year. I mean, so uh, it's a real problem for the developing countries. Principally, the budgeting is one of them. Thank you so much, um, Jose Pablo. Um, colleagues, um, I know there's so much more we could talk about. Um, I found the, the question around how do you, um, do you have tools, mechanisms to balance also the different interests that sit behind, you know, all the different aspects is uh, one we could probably have another um, knowledge cafe on. So it goes beyond the this space. But um, I think this has been, I hope for you as well, been uh, very interesting. Um, you know, some key takeaways, uh, again, Laurel, you reframed it um, out of the summit into solutions. Um, this SDG summit was that opportunity to to feed into and to, you know, ensure there's commitment at the very highest level. And then now, now, now what? So what? What happens at the country level? And I think we've heard uh, excellent examples on both the preparations, but also how this is now informing um, decisions, policy making, investments, etc. Um, so not just planning and analysis, but really going into um, into action. It is about um, choices, political choices. It is about a, a science, a data, and evidence based, um, um, you know, analysis to feed feed these um, um, these decisions. And we've also heard, you know, what is holding us back. What are some of the challenges? Um, that that we're facing uh, financing, budgeting, competing interests, um, and ultimately, you know, also um, sort of that it is a political choice and different interests. The point we didn't get to um, that that will also influence that political decision making process. With this, um, on behalf of the IPPN organizing team, I thank uh, Laurel, Jose Pablo, and Lamin for your insightful presentations and to all of you out there, all participants for sharing, uh, for listening and sharing your experiences, your reflections with us in today's um, Knowledge um, Cafe. I invite you to join the IPVN network if you're not part of it um, already to continue the conversation. You'll be able to access the presentations, the recording of today's session and other relevant resources on the IPVN platform um, through the link posted in the chat. Um, please note that if you share additional um, questions, etc., we will get back to you over and, and beyond this um, this event, this live event. And we look forward to seeing you again in mid-November uh, to further explore how integrated policy approaches help UN country teams and governments uh, implement the cooperation framework and make progress on the 2030 agenda. Big thank you to all of you, uh, and I wish you a very good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.